Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Julianne Taylor-Shaw as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential therapists so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Julianne Taylor-Shaw is an integrative therapist who weaves together several experiential modalities, including interpersonal neurobiology, somatic experiencing, inner community, internal family systems, and coherence therapy into her work. She specializes in trauma recovery and couples therapy and teaches clinicians worldwide on how to integrate discoveries in neuroscience into her clinical work. She's an associate instructor with the Coherence Psychology Institute and has just authored her first book, Setting Boundaries That Stick, how neurobiology can help you rewire your brain to feel safe, connected, and empowered. So excited to have you here, Jules. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm oh so thrilled goodness. to be with you. Yeah. I was just reading that intro and I was like, there's so much more that you do that probably would take a while to like. It just, and and do people even need to know? <laughs> they'll know, they'll know soon when they, when they oh look you up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love it. So uh, yeah, let's jump in. Like it's yeah. you know you you seem to specialize in a lot of experiential modalities. But yeah, and I'm yeah. integrative. So yeah. yeah, I think about I think about therapy in general in like where we are now in the field in kind of three different categories. So you've got your clinician who loves a thing. They're an IFS therapist. And when you go to see them, you are doing IFS therapy. It is the only therapy you're going to do. It's a brilliant therapy. How awesome. So they're kind of model driven. So you could be a CBT therapist and pretty much all your techniques are CBT, or you could be an IFS or somatic experiencing practitioner. And a hundred percent of what you're doing is kind of SE centered, right? So that's one category of folks. And then there's another category of folks who are probably trained in lots of different things and um, maybe don't quite have um they kind of go from their gut about what to use when um and it may be driven by like what the client seems to be responding to um and i think that's a lot of us actually i think that's most people would be like probably not adhering only to one model and kind of going for a feel in the room about what's going to be helpful in this moment. And then there's integrative, and I would fall into that category. So integrative means you've got a theory of mind, a theory of change. And that the that theoretical space is, is really the center of what's orienting, of organizing your toolbox. So I I organize my toolbox from a thought about brain integration. So when I say that, what I mean, so I'm, I'm neurobiology dork. So please stop me and say, what does that mean <laughs> when I go too fast or am weird about the neurobiology? So here's, here's how I think about it. I think about it like, okay, an integrated brain state and an unintegrated brain state um, they're just two different ways the brain might show up and be in response to each other. And the, the, when I say that, what I mean is how are the different areas of the brain? How are the different systems in the brain talking to each other in a moment? And one of those states is not different or not, not different, not better than another state. Right. So I don't think of unintegrated as bad and more integrated as good. I also do not put them on a light switch. They're more on a dimmer. So you could have less integrated states and more integrated states and more integrated states are good at certain stuff and less integrated states are good at other stuff. So less integrated is great if you're in physical danger. You don't need to plan to get away from the tiger. You just need to climb the tree and get away from the tiger. <laughs> right. And then afterwards you can breathe and go, oh gosh, the tiger almost got me. Now I can feel afraid about that. So when I think about that, I think about a moment when my kiddo um, early, early in her life, she was like in maybe 10, 
10 months old or so. Anyway, I'm <laughs> on vacation and changing the poopiest diaper you've ever seen. It was awful. It was so gross. And, and we're on a bed that's kind of high up and the floor is tile because it was like a beach thing. And I look over and the bag where I have to put the diaper I've just contained is twisted shut. And here's my memory. My memory is I looked at the thing twisted shut. And my next memory is I'm holding my kid in front of my face. She's upside down laughing hysterically. And I'm like this, <gasps> like I just ran a 50 yard dash, right? So that was an unintegrated brain state. I do not know exactly how my spidey senses, other than I was already kind of on alert because I knew it was a high bed on the tile floor. Um, but somehow my skin, the peripheral vision, my auditory system caught she was falling off the bed. Thank God these brains, my heart brain and my gut brain actually do have direct um, feed. I, they don't even have to go through my head to my big muscles. They shot my arm out. Also, thank goodness, I happened to make contact with her leg at a part of my hand that had a reflex. All of that happened, boom, like that. Now that is awesome. We want that to happen. <laughs> and that is, so that's a less integrated state. And so less integrated states are awesome at stuff like that. So we move first, feel and think about it later, organize the experience later, create a narrative later. More integrated states are also really good at stuff, just different stuff. So they're really good at creative thinking, nuance, holding multiple ideas simultaneously. So if I had to make a really complicated decision in my life around like where to go, create a five-year plan, who am I as a human, all those kinds of things are supported by the more integrated brain states. So grief processing, creative thought, nuanced communication, relational wellness, <laughs> getting through a rocky conversation with your partner without totally blowing it up. <laughs> All of that is served by more integrated brain states. And so that is my organizing principle is what is it that creates more integrated brain states? And so that the answer is actually really, really simple to that. Um, it, our brain in, becomes more or less integrated based on our perception of what is and is not okay. And by that, I do not mean calm. What I mean is I can handle this. Does that make sense? You, you mean less integrated is I can't, re I'm not handling this as well. Integrated is I've got this, it's hard, but I can move through it. That's exactly, exactly. So if... I've perceived a situation as I can handle this. This may be difficult, but I've got this. The brain knows I have lots of time. Mm. And so that slower integrated process is okay. And I have time for the nuance. And so it's the integration is actually in reaction to the perception. So this is why I care a ton about implicit memory because this I promise this all has a lot to do with experiential work. <laughs> I'm realizing like you, the folks listening are like, this isn't an experience. What are you even talking about? This has a ton to do with experiential work. So the implicit memory system feeds every moment of every day in terms of how we think about the world and how we're perceiving in the world. Second, 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 second. So your brain has to do this really, really hard thing, which is to make sense of all the light and shadow and movement around you, all the chaos that actually is, and then figure out what to do like five seconds from now to help you get to the next goal or keep you safe. Um, so, ugh, that's a complicated thing. And the way we do it is we lean into our implicit memory system, which is very different than your explicit memory. So explicit memory is that memory where you could like recall what you did on your last birthday, or you could think a fact like uh, who was the first president of the United States. And I don't know that because I was there, but somebody told me and I believe them and I remember it. That's explicit memory. Implicit memory is all about an emotional knowing 
basically. Like, mm -hmm. what feels true about the world, right? So gravity is part of your implicit memory system. So if I hold this up, and I'm just going to tell you I'm going to drop it. It's just a little pin. Yeah. If I tell you I'm going to drop it, you don't have to think the thought like, oh, that's gravity is a thing on this planet. And so that pen will fall down. You don't have to think that. It's like your whole body knows. I call it an emotional knowing. Oh, this pen is going to fall. But here's the thing. Is everyone watching this also, even as I say I'm going to drop the pen, has their own response to what it would mean to drop something? Right? And everybody who's listening is actually having a different experience with that. Some people are going, so big whoop, drop the pen. Other people are going, if she doesn't drop the pen soon, I'm going to really freak out because I don't like waiting. For other people, they're saying, um, oh no, don't drop, like everything in your body's prepping you to like catch the pen when I drop it. So all of that's part of your implicit memory system too. So how you, how you perceive what is okay, handleable for you and what you perceive as not handleable for you has everything to do with your implicit memory system. What? It all I makes know. so much sense. Yeah. And so that's wait, why so I'm an experiential therapist. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. What were good. You, where were you going? Where, where, yeah, so where just were you going the, just then? Just, just, uh, just to sort of like consolidate you. So the sort of like rudder for your work is the theory of mind and change, which, mm -hmm. which is connected to this, the idea of implicit and explicit right. memory, which is like, right. which is explicit autobiographical. I can remember the pictures, the scenes, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Implicit mm -hmm. is the sort of out of awareness, unconscious knowings, meanings, all of that stuff. Exactly. So what I would say is, oh, the brain, how the brain works is we respond to our perception of okayness by moving to more or less integration in a way that is adaptive to that perception. That's point one. And point two is that perception is fed by every experience you have ever had through your implicit memory system because that's how your brain is wired. And then point three is if my client is coming into me, probably. They are wanting to have more integrated experiences than they are having. Which means that now I have a goal, a therapeutic goal, where we're going to wonder about, huh, well, what is it in your implicit memory system that is leading to a perception of not okayness? And is that actually true? Because not everything in my implicit mind is actually true. It used to be, right? If I did this little experiment while I was teaching, I would actually have a little tremor in my hand. Because for me, dropping a pen means really bad. Dropping anything means really bad. That was a really, that was a no, no mistakes, no mistakes allowed. And now I can hold the pen up and be totally fine. <laughs> I know I'm going to drop it and be totally fine because actually now accidents are in my okayness category, but that meant me shifting my implicit mind. So this is why I care a ton about experiential therapy because I cannot talk to my implicit memory system in English. I have to experience the emotional knowing in order to have any kind of shift happen inside that implicit memory system and some of the stuff can be moved and some of the stuff it can can be shifted so that we can feel okay so it may be like when i was a kid this thing felt threatening but if that neural network knew i was grown up it would no longer feel threatening so but the thing is you can't talk to the implicit memory system mm -hmm. by just going blah 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 that's why I care so much about experiential work and why I'm trained in a ton of them. And I integrate them all, all of them to help transform the implicit memory system because I cannot change what happened to me, but I can change what I learned from what happened to me if 
what I learned is not totally true or is not totally true anymore. Make sense so far? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. um, like maybe you could use that example of your of your daughter and the, mm -hmm. you know, and because and, mm -hmm. I guess I'm curious how, how did you, it sounds like you worked on that and you were able to unpack the implicit knowings from that experience in some way. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you how... mean like with my kid? Like, thank goodness I knew that was a not okay situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well... like, like that, like this, the pen thing, I can unpack that. Um, the daughter thing, that was an accurate. See, sometimes, oh, isn't this tricky? Sometimes our perception of not okayness is accurate. Mm -hmm. And we should move to less integration. So like the daughter example, I love that this is coming up. This is perfect. Okay. So like the daughter example is a perfect example of my mind flipping its lid and that being absolutely fabulous. And I would never, ever want me or any client to lose the ability to accurately perceive we are in a not okay situation. Whew, we cannot handle this. We should splinter the mind into pieces basically for just a second and have all the systems operate independently so it's not like i wasn't feeling fear it's that i wasn't consciously feeling fear it's not that i wasn't moving fast but i wasn't conscious of the movement i don't even have a memory visually i have the i have the bag closed and i have my kid in front of my face but i'm missing the middle part i don't remember catching her why? Because my hippocampus was shut down at that moment. We're not, we're not encoding that memory. We don't need to. What we need to do is save the kid and then think about it later. So there are moments where being less integrated is perfect. And there are moments where, like, let's say a couple comes into me and I do a ton of experiential work inside couples therapy. Um, let's say a couple comes into me and they are fighting every time they talk about money it is a blowout rager well they are they are having unintegrated brain responses to the discussion of money what they're hoping for is to have different kinds of experiences with each other as they're talking about money okay so now i'm curious oh when you start talking about money what is it that your implicit mind, your subcortical mind, knows is about to happen that's making you flip your lid and think everything is not okay. And is any of that changeable? Yeah, what's happening? I can tell. Yeah. Is I, I was what but is that in asking that though, you're you're inviting a cognitive discussion, Rob. Is, well, is, I'm is not there... asking that of a client. I'm asking yeah, that yeah. of my brain. Yeah, okay, good. Because if I asked it, if I asked it of a client, now I'm going to have a cognitive discussion and the part of their brain, which is left dominant and high frontal cortex leaning is not never answers a question with, I don't know. It just makes stuff up. <laughs> Gazniga, Gazaniga, Gazaniga is how you pronounce his name. I can give you that reference if you want to put it in notes for people. So uh, Mike Gazaniga did some really great work on this. And what he discovered was the um, left frontal cortex basically will not admit to not knowing things and just make stuff up instead. <laughs> And so if I ask a client, well, what do you think about this thing? What do you think you learned from your mother in that moment? I will absolutely never find the answer because they will go down a path of making stuff up and believe it, 100% believe it. So I need to listen in a really different way because the implicit memory system speaks different languages than English. Hmm. Movement, sensation. Um, and I think of it as like embodied. Sometimes it just show up in parts. So parts work is really helpful. Um, imagery. It may be all of a sudden a flash of a memory that doesn't even seem related will come up for a client. So this is all about slowing down, helping the client come into relationship with their present moment self in the experience of being alive. I think about it as tra tracking basic behavior, affect, sensation, image, cognition, basic. The basic ways our brain is speaking to us. And I'm leaning way heavier into the behavior, the affect, the sensation, the image, and then 
out of that, the emotional knowing is going to emerge. So you can have this idea of like this, 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 this cop, this person in this couple knows to expect something in your mind and you're like how do mm -hmm. i create an experience which bumps him into revealing this knowing to us in an experiential right. way to themselves to i themselves. mean it's probably going to be something that they have no idea they even think they know so how would you do it with this particular person? right so let's say i was with a couple and they had this fight about money so I would maybe, uh, one, I'd slow down and, and ask them to do things like, can you feel any sensation happening in your body? Where do you feel something? You want to, you want a key for helping a client track their body, especially for clients who have a hard time with it. Don't ask, what are you feeling in your body? Ask, where are you feeling something in your body? It makes your parietal lobe do a scan of your entire body. And so they have to track it to answer the question. So there's a little, there's, there's a little trick. Ask where instead of what. So where are you feeling something in your body? So I might ask that. So let's say they're just chatting with each other and they start to get a little activated. I can tell there's some Riley emotion happening. And I, I might say, okay, can, I, can we do something weird? Can we slow down for just a sec? And just both of you track, where are you feeling anything in your body right now? And the guy goes, I don't feel anything. And the woman says, I feel my chest is on fire. I say, great, good. Hold that chest is on fire. Can I help your, your partner for just a minute? Because he said, there's nothing happening. And he, he says, yeah, she's freaking out. She's always freaking out. Yeah, so as you notice, she's always freaking out. And you have that thought. I want you to think that thought. Oh, she's always freaking out. And then I just want you to notice, where do I feel any sensation at all? He goes, I feel nothing. And then I go like this. Is it like numb nothing? Or is it like empty nothing? Or like heavy nothing? Where exactly are you feeling the nothing? It's because I'm trying to help him learn how to track his system. Because unless he's had some major brain injury, there is, there is a pathway feeding that information. He just doesn't know how to look at it. Well, I guess I feel something. Oh, okay, where? Or I guess it's blank nothing. Oh, like blank nothing. Okay, where is the blank nothing? Is there an edge to the blank nothing? So this is me, one, I'm just slowing them down and teaching them how to use experiential space. So I might start with a body track, for example. Then we'd say, okay, we're going to do once they learn how to do that. But let's do something really crazy. Let's imagine that you're about to talk about money. And you're going to turn to each other and you're going to take a really deep breath and look at your partner's face and notice they're actually super peaceful. Could you track your body right now? Where do you feel anything happening inside? If that surprised them enough chances are i'm gonna get a little thread from the implicit memory system yeah what would happen if your partner made that face but then you said oh i wonder what's happening right now in you instead of getting defensive let's try it oh do that face again i might even have them do the experiment and then say the thing say oh i wonder what's happening in you right now instead of doing the defensive thing they usually do i might even have them do that and track their body while they're doing mm -hmm. that and sounds, slow down and track this moment yeah mm -hmm. yeah it sounds wonderful i mean the, the part of where are you feeling this in your body and also fleshing out when there's nothing what that nothing is is so because so, like, I, I can sense that people that live in their heads you could easily go oh well they're not feeling anything so i guess not a lot i guess there's about that nothing we can do that is absolutely not the case your your lower brain is processing 11 million bits of information per second and your upper brain is processing somewhere between 5 to 60 bits of information per second there's a huge difference there your body is feeding you information you i love antonio damasio's quote about emotion he says emotions are a cognition like any other cognition they are the result of a curious physiological arrangement that has made the brain the body's captive audience. 
your brain, every moment of every day is going, how are we doing? How are we doing? How are we doing? Every second, many, many, many times a second, depending on which brain system we're talking about in the thalamic sweep, we're even talking about 40 times per second. We're sweeping our system for info. So there is no such thing as you're not getting information from your body. There's only such thing as you're ignoring information from your body. Yeah, what's happening even as I say that? It's brilliant. It's blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think well, you know a, what? Yeah, go ahead. I just think it's wonderful to, to hear that as, um, you know, this experiential work can be harder with people who are sort of more in their heads intellectualizing. And I think what you're saying is you can... There, there is something there and you just have to believe that there is and usher them into getting there. Like the sense it's, feeling of nothing is actually a something if you, if you spend a bit of time with it. Something. Exactly. It's actually mm -hmm. a something, but you have to slow down. So the thing is we can lean into biology and go, well, unless there's a massive brain injury of some kind, I mean, you're just wired to do this. So whether you're paying attention to it or not is one question. But whether or not the information's there, eh, it's always there. The question is, am I willing to sit internally with my not knowing what's there? I don't know what's going on. Can I sit with my doubt and my not knowing long enough and chill enough to hang out with you? so that you can move through your not knowing to become curious instead of just dismissive. And that's, there's a study out there called love yourself as a person, doubt yourself as a therapist. And it is a study specifically about how there are better therapeutic outcomes. Here's what they found out. There are better therapeutic outcomes if the clinician hung out with not knowing with whether they were doing anything right or helpful, <laughs> but they sat in a lot of not knowing and a lot of doubt about whether they were being helpful while they were very kind to themselves. If both were there, then the clients got further. And I think that has to do with us um, creating a space where the client is growing a ton of self-trust because it is more about them coming into relationship with their implicit C, with their intuitive mind and discovering that there's wisdom there than them leaning into me as the source of wisdom. That's just not that helpful. What are they supposed to do when I leave my, they leave my office? So rather than having cognitive conversations, I want to help you come into relationship with yourself because there's all this data happening in your lower brain that most of us, and I, I practice in the States. Here, most people ignore it. You know? and, and most people come into me saying, I can't feel feelings. I've never felt anything in my body. And that's not really a thing for me. That's not how my brain works. That is my client. Like that's most of the people I work with. I work in Austin, Texas. It's a bunch of tech people. And... <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm yeah. right there with you. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, that Okay. So we need to doubt ourselves, but be kind in order to be able to Yeah. You help. have to be kind to you Yeah. because you have to regulate the fact that you're hanging out in a hammock of not knowing. Yeah, and that's the wonderful thing about experiential work is the non-interpretive. You're mm -hmm. going to tell you're, the client, you're going to elicit from the client what's going on, not you tell the client, this is what's going on. I actually have no idea. How could like, you possibly? I could not. I cannot. And the, the second I think I know, I'm going to get in my own way. That's brilliant. Right? Confirmation bias. So I have to know that I don't know to chill out and be open to possibility. And mm -hmm. me being open to possibility helps them be open to possibility. What? So when I think about um, moving towards, uh, or like I want people to know how I practice because I want you to take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. So, right? Because this is my version of what I've studied and reality and all that. I could be totally wrong. So what I think about is, okay, so if a brain 
shifts integration level based on perception. True. And if perception is shiftable in the implicit mind, and if the implicit mind speaks behavior, affect, image, and sensation better than English, then I better be slowing the client down and helping them come into contact with movements in their body, that's the behavior stuff, or even like clenching in the throat, I put that in the behavior category. We're stopping the voice for some reason, but why? So I might do something weird, like let's say I was tracking a sensation in the throat. Here's what I might ask the client. One, I'm gonna ask him, how do you feel towards that? It's an assessment question and it's an intervention at the same time. So when I ask, how do you feel towards that sensation? I'm asking them to separate their orbital medial prefrontal cortex, that's the witnessing mind third eye position. I'm asking them to differentiate that from what's happening in the body and all that lower brain data. And then I'm asking them, how do you feel towards it? <gasps> come into relationship with it. So I'm asking, could you upper brain, could you come into relationship with the lower brain and tell me how that's going? And they might say, I hate it, I want it to go away. In which case I would say, of course you do, it sucks. It's awful. It may have information for us too, but it's still awful. So of course you hate it. Well, now I'm kind of wondering, oh, okay. Let's come into to sit our little mind right down next to it. So here's what I would do with that. So one, I'm asking how do you feel towards it? Maybe they hate it. If we get even a teeny window of curiosity, I'll jump on it. I'm thinking about someone who was having difficulty coming into relationship with her body. And she was a teacher for kindergartners and she loved it. And she got teacher awards and stuff. Here's what I did. I asked, could you take the kindest, most patient teacher version of you and place that version of you right next to that sensation in your throat? And from that space, I don't want you to sit in the middle of your throat. Bring that energy right next to her, right next to this little sensation here, and turn and ask, oh, what do you want me to know? Keeping it really open-ended like that, what I'm doing neurochemically there is I'm asking, hey, could you turn on all your GABA centers here so we can regulate, but not shut down. We're going to come into relationship with it. And then ask an open-ended question to wonder about what maybe information this sensation has for me. It's a way easier way in than if I ask the person, well, why do you think your throat is clenched? Yeah, it's like you're, um, well, it sounds like you're talking about like IFS a bit of having them be in self, right. like curious, compassionate to this sure. part where the anger is there, but you're saying you are inviting her to become this compassionate kindergarten teacher to this part. To this part that may be feeling scared or angry or freaked out or shame or whatever it's feeling, right? Because we don't know. But we're going to ask it, oh, hey, how are you doing? What do you want us to know about life and stuff? And, and what that does chemically is we let the activation that's showing up as a body sensation, we let the chemical activation stay active and we regulate enough, come into connection enough that it's not putting us into a state of this is not okay now, I'm going to flip my lid. We're keeping integrated even while the activation is there, which is a really big goal that I have. So I know we were thinking about contrasting, comparing uh, all these experiential therapies. I love them all. Yeah, well, I, I just want to all. say it sounds like well, well that part, that technique or uh, maybe not technique mm -hmm. but approach was yeah. sort of IFS and then when you were talking about totally. the couple and inviting the the gentleman to imagine not responding in defense was kind of symptom deprivation coherence that's therapy. a deprivation from coherence therapy straight out of Bruce Ecker's work straight out of Robin Tickick's book yep exactly mm -hmm. and I might somatically track in detail like SE and I'll mm -hmm. do it all in a single session mm-hmm and that's some, I don't think of somatic experiencing as better or worse or anything than sensory motor psychotherapy. They're really similar. It's really similar to Comey. I just happen to be trained more thoroughly in somatic experiencing, which is why I talk about that one. But I don't, I think of it as like, 
if you want to be an experiential therapist can you can you do some parts work what kind of parts work do you like do you like ifs i'm also trained in inner community which is bonnie Badnock's work and i love her stuff it's probably the deepest parts training i have is through bonnie's work even though well i don't know probably 50 50 because i'm ifs i'm all the way through ifs at the normal levels so so like do are we interweaving some sort of parts work are we able to emotionally track in a way that's differentiated so can i help a client hold more than one feeling simultaneously so if it comes up as oh i'm just overwhelmed there's like eight feelings in there you start take the spaghetti apart is what i think about right hold on can we track a feeling with color the thing is though hmm, what do i what do i think i want to say about that is is i what i what i need in my toolbox to be an experiential therapist is some sensation tracking physical tracking of some kind some understanding of memory reconsolidation neuroscience which is the understanding of how to change the implicit memory system not what happened to you we do not change what happened to us what we change is what we learned from what happened to us and you probably need some sort of parts work you like nlp do nlp you like ego state do ego state you like ifs do ifs you like inner community do inner you like all of them go train in all of them that's what i do i have I'm super fun with the trainings so so i don't think of um, is it weird to say i feels like i'm maybe getting a political but it feels sometimes to me like we've gotten into this place where we're siloing models and talking about them like like one's better than the other and i don't think about them like that at all mm -hmm. You know, I'm just thinking not you and me. Yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. like in a larger community, it's like, well, I do this one, this one's better. And it feels kind of like somewhere along the line, marketing got involved in therapy. <laughs> and we were supposed to like talk about why you should buy this one and why it's better. <laughs> well, I feel like what you're talking about has defined psychotherapy for for how since the beginning. And until mm -hmm until you sound a lot like Bruce who who is saying look we have this methodology and use whatever experiential tools you need to get to use to get through this mechanism of change totally which is memory reconsolidation which is re memory reconsolidation because memory reconsolidation for the fast 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 definition version for anybody who's never heard that word before is just the neuroscientific label for how a, a neural network that didn't fire in one way changes and it never fires in that old way again now it fires in a new way so it's basically our brains have to do something so cool they have to remember the important stuff that we've learned and not forget it and not have to actively remember it to like function so when you're walking across a floor you are you are remembering how to walk but you don't actively have to pull that data so yay we want that we want you to know that gravity is a thing and not walk off the edge of a cliff i don't want you to have to remember that to not do that that's awesome okay so also the world changes and your brain needs a way to update long ago memory because stuff changes that's the reality of the world so you don't just need to remember without really trying to remember, but you also need an ability to change the memory. In fact, even gravity can be forgotten. The astronauts that went to the space station are coming back and have forgotten about gravity because they reconsolidated into a world where gravity doesn't exist. And then they do drop pens and glasses all over the place until they relearn the gravity. If they go up there long enough, they reconsolidate even gravity. So if, if an astronaut can update to gravity is no longer a thing, we can update just about anything, right? As long as this is why I love it too. Can I tell you why I love reconsolidation? <laughs> it's it only will update if it is subjectively true. So it's not about what I think. It's not about me putting my stuff onto my client. To, to work with the implicit memory system incredibly well. We have to honor that it's actually 
their subjective experience that is way more important than anything I think. And it's only when an old emotional knowing comes into contact with a subjective mismatch. Like, oh wait, that can't possibly be true at the same time. Only in that moment will the network open and be ready to take in new learning. So I love it because it's so respectful. And Bruce and I think really, really similarly. This is this is why we chat and talk to we talk about all this stuff in a really, really similar way. Is is we both think about it, I think, I don't want to speak for him, but in in the idea, once you understand a little bit about how the implicit memory system is affecting every moment of every day and how those learnings are mm, held in nonverbal meaning and that those are trans they're transformable if it is not true what they learned anymore or wasn't ever either way then then everything can change and now the way i perceive the world is different because your brain is walking through the world with history colored glasses on but you can change the color of the lenses you cannot change the fact you're wearing history colored glasses you don't get to change that but you can change the color of the lenses because you can change what you learned from what happened so once you know that then and then you know oh but that system only does experiential to speak to to be understood to hear you and then it's just like i don't know use all the experiential i love it mm -hmm. yeah so i integrate them all mm -hmm. that's so it's so um exciting i'm sure for people to hear that about updating the implicit and but also that it can't happen by chatting about it Oh, this thing happened to me it felt bad i learned this it's like right. the experience needs to happen and like you said using all of so much experiencing ifs ct is like whatever it takes to get this person to mm -hmm. reveal to you their implicit knowing and mm -hmm. then updating it perhaps with a juxtaposition that you also have them feel into in some way right really... i'm also do brain spotting and emdr it's the same thing mm -hmm. it's it's all about having this internal experience of oh i'm i know for sure this is how the world is oh no wait hold on well those two things can't be true at the same time the second that the second both experiences are here and your brain's regulated enough to catch it if that is happening the only thing that happens next is a reconsolidation it's not i don't get reconsolidations to happen i set up an environment wherein my client is in such good relationship with themselves if their memory system needs reconsolidating of course it's going to happen but it's not like i'm i'm aiming to like hmm, let me say it differently i think that as therapists we are taught we're supposed to do a lot to heal people or save people or that we're supposed to be very involved and you're supposed to know what you're doing and you're supposed to get things to happen. <laughs> and I think it sets our brains up because you're, you're dealing with a complex system on the couch in front of you that isn't responding the way you were trained they would respond when you learned the protocol. <laughs> um, now you're freaking out and your brain just went into not okay category. And if your brain's in the not okay category, you're flipping your lid a little bit. You're trying not to run out of the room, but you kind of want to. <laughs> so I guess I'm in a space where I'm trying to help us be way gentler with ourselves while we're doing this work and hang out and not knowing a lot more so that we can teach our clients it's okay to be in that not knowing space and curious space and discovery space yeah, it's like when i can do it i can teach you to do it right it's like a gift i do this as a gift to you and it's accidentally a gift to me too mm -hmm. but you gotta i i was talking to somebody is it okay to cuss on this or no 
<laughs> I love that look. That was a, I have no idea look. I will not just in case. Um, I will, I will say it in another way. I, I said, do you, do, do you love yourself so deeply? I was doing an experience with a, with a clinician. And so what we did was we, we had her imagine um, being with this client in this hard moment. And I had her walk to the door of the therapy room and we are hanging out together. So I asked, could you, could you and me hang out? We're just going to like lean up against the wall and watch this sweet lady do therapy. She's like, don't look at the client. No, no, no. Don't look at the client. Look at the therapist. Do you love her? Like really love her? She's messing up. Maybe, maybe she's messing up. Can we love her anyway? Like, can you let every cell in your body get how amazing she is right this second? She's like, whoa, I've never thought about myself like this in therapy. Like, exactly. We need to be doing this experiential work with ourselves so that we can hang out in deep kindness towards us and not knowing. So we can teach our clients how to hang out with uh, not knowing and deep kindness towards themselves. Does that make sense? total sense yeah. yeah yeah i really love the permission to not know and actually not knowing together with your client is such a wonderful thing if you can be comfortable in that and i'm sure a lot of therapists are trained not to be i think we are trained not to be this is i think of it as the the thing that holds me in that is i know a little bit about how the brain works i know a little bit about how memories change what they think they learned I know a little bit about how the subcortical brain talks and that knowing those are knowledges, right? I'm, I'm kind of using that as a, as a hammock so that I can let the rest of it sway. I love it. Yeah. yeah. It's really, um, yeah, I think it's hard like stepping into experiential work and being okay with not knowing and being like comfortable like let's just discover together but also really honoring the client of like yeah I don't know as the professional we're gonna you're gonna well, I'm gonna elicit it from you we're gonna do that together right. until I have until I have a felt sense that I do understand your subjective implicit knowing of the world and it's conscious to you now and then we can move on totally. to has it ever not been that way or whatever the juxtaposition experience will totally. be totally and the explaining part is all really important actually so but it it comes second the intuitive mind is a sacred gift the rational mind a faithful servant so the the idea that's a quote from einstein in a letter he wrote so the the idea is you experience it first and then you explain it and that puts edges that explanation puts edges on this expansive right-brained experience that Mm, Jill Bolte Taylor talked about it really well in a, in a TED talk called My Stroke of Insight. She had a stroke in her left hemisphere and she was talking about it affectionately as La La Land. And she said what she was experiencing was like leaning up against the wall and she knew her arm and the wall were one. And there was no wall and there was no arm. There was no edge because everything was flowing and everything was interchanging all at once. That's true. That's actually a real way of seeing the world and it's accurate. And then her left brain would come back online and go, oh no, I'm having a stroke. I need to call for help, right? And so she's trying to dial the phone, but then the numbers turned into squiggles and her finger and the phone are one. That was a total right-brained experience. So we don't wanna only be an experience because nobody would ever get anywhere on time and you and I would not even be having this conversation because computers never would have been in, I'm, I do not, knock in any way our explaining or our cognitions. I love them. I want them to match the order of the energy and information flow in the brain. Experience first, explain second. Do it again. Experience first, explain second. So I want to be having these experiences and then as the experience is unfolding, and that, whew, that surprise moment's happening again and again, which is a surprise is, for those who don't know, a moment where probably a neural network opened up to be open and receptive to new learning. Um, it hit what's called lability, which is a fancy word for flexi, 
Um, so so it, that neural network opened up and wow, new, new learning is possible. And of course, on the back end, I want to help my client move into explanation of, oh, if this is true, now what's true about this situation with money and your partner? And as we're going to that space, he's now saying, oh, my God, I've been treating you like my mother this whole time. I'm so sorry, hon. You're different from her in a thousand ways. And she's more integrated. So she says, actually, I am like your mother in these two ways, though. And so I totally understand. <laughs> and now I'm asking them, and what do you feel in your body now? Where do you feel that in your body now? Because we're going to go right back into the experience. Does that make sense? Total sense. Yeah. Yeah. So once that, once this particular client is implicitly, I mean, experientially felt the implicit knowing, which is guiding the defensiveness of his partner and it's conscious now that you don't even need to guide the doctor to position it's it's just happens because he looks at his wife and go oh you're not my mom you're not my mom you're not my mom exactly oh my god i have been treating you like my mom oh when i did it this other time and then i did this other time when that starts happening you know the reorganization is taking place and then we just hang and we we hang out with it and know okay this is this is going to be helpful and then we'll see what happens next. Yeah, because I think in general, I think my main goal is to help clients have access to more frequently integrated brain states, more frequent access to integrated brain states, and high flexibility between less integrated and more integrated. Because if they have both of those, they can respond to whatever's happening in the world, mostly with okayness. And that takes an enormous amount of self-trust. So really, moment to moment, I'm going, how can we help you build trust in you? How can we help you build relationship with yourself? What exactly are you in relationship to when you're in relationship with yourself? That's great. And I really love that you have said throughout this that uh, not integrated versus integrated isn't is it's not good versus bad there's a there's a space for both exactly we want access to both i just don't want to have unintegrated responses in a situation where integrated would be better and i don't want to have integrated responses when unintegrated would be better <laughs> really? i do want to catch the child yeah yeah. That was, that's, that's yeah, it's not it's not good or bad. It's just, oh, a lot of times when people are coming in, you know, if I'm if I'm entering a workspace and I know I have good ideas and I never open my mouth because I am absolutely terrified in that workspace. I cannot like I freeze up and I cannot speak. And that's why I've come in, right? I cannot ask that client. Oh, why are you scared? And get any kind of answer that's going to be helpful to us. What I can know, though, is mm, that implicit mind thinks something's really scary. Something's in the not okay category in this. I don't know what it is, but something is. And then we can wonder and we can track and we can do a parts map with it. Parts work stuff. I could help them track their body. We could do a symptom deprivation. That's why I love all the tools <laughs> because I don't have one way in. I have 50 ways in to offer to my people to maybe be really curious in a very specific way where you are more likely to hear the, what your implicit mind knows about what is so hard about the situation. And once we discover it, then we can wonder about whether or not it's actually true. Because it may not be. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. Yeah. Sometimes it is true. I'm thinking about, I work with people who, who have systemic oppression stuff happening. That is true. I can't make that not true. Mm -hmm. But sometimes shifting how empowered I feel or how much I trust myself to protect me or to... Um, 
to I'm thinking about like so I'm I'm born in a woman body and there are moments where that's a scary thing right um, sometimes that's really accurate uh, moving to my car fast at night if I'm a, if I live, work late at my office and I'm my car's the only one in the parking lot that's not dumb that's actually really smart it's <laughs> right sometimes I have to deal with that and it may be that when my husband's voice gets a little loud he's not actually physically threatening to me so even though it's true that being born in this body and the culture in which I'm born makes me more um, uh, potentially uh, threatened, that's accurate. There's nothing untrue about that. And in some scenarios, it may be more dangerous than other scenarios. Well, if I had a blanket reaction to all of them of panic, then maybe I'm not mm, as empowered as I could be. Or maybe I don't, maybe if I'm scared, like let's say my husband raised his voice to me and I'm so scared that I don't speak up and say, oh, that doesn't feel good. Can we talk differently? Can I come into a space between me and me where I know saying that is okay, if it actually is, which with my husband, it would be fine. Yeah, that's, there's so much there that you just shared. Um, I'm conscious yeah. of our time, Jules. Yeah, I wanna, yeah, yeah. I want to sort of comment on what you just said and then maybe ask mm -hmm. you a question about yeah. where people should start if they're interested in this type of work. But when you were talking mm -hmm. about the thought when a client comes in and they say, yeah, when I'm when I'm at work, I just can't open up. And your sense mm -hmm. is instead of sort of pathologizing this as some disorder, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, why is it emotionally necessary on some level in your mm -hmm. mind? And how do I get this client to bring that into their consciousness instead of like mm -hmm. yeah this is the sm says it's this and you probably should just you know force yeah. yourself not to do it you know um <laughs> Let's which i love that stopping. i yeah, do yeah. not do that <laughs> yeah, yeah good good and yeah. also this sense this sense of like not it's not necessarily eradicating the implicit knowing because that might be um important in some situations so it's kind of moving them from black or white into the gray gray nuanced experience of it Because the relationship between them and them is what's going to create a space that is kind enough that we can let the activation come and not flip our lids enough to discover if it's actually true. They'll, they'll spontaneously understand it if the emotional... I call it a psychological floor. If the psychological floor has a rug on it that was true back then, but isn't true now, or was maybe never true. So like, I'm thinking about clients I work with that uh, maybe know they're bad. They know it with everything in them. They know they're bad. They know it was their fault. But it was actually never their fault. Because the abuse was never their fault. That was you know, generations. That's a very complicated answer about exactly why that stuff goes down. But I promise you it ain't a two-year-old kid or a four-year-old kid or a six-year-old kid. It's not their fault they got hit. Um, so sometimes we discover it was never true. But in doing so, I had faced the grief about what happened to me. So we, if you want to work experientially, you have to be able to hold grief. Mm -hmm. Right, because that's what's going to come next. If if I discover, oh wow, mom couldn't take care of me. Oof. That was terrifying. And I trust myself enough to handle that experience in my grown-up body and to hold that little one. Here's parts work coming back in. Look at that. <laughs> right? You can see I'm weaving them. I I'm a big weaver. I like all the things. I don't like one thing. I like all the things. I must be like, I'll drop in Enneagram stuff for those who care. I must be a seven on the Enneagram. I want all the things. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, so I, I, when I'm, when I'm with that, what's going to open up next is grief. Cause that little one was actually in a really scary situation that she couldn't control. 
And the good news is that I learned actually it was never my fault. I was never actually a POS or anything, right? Yeah. And the hard news is I faced the grief about what happened. Yeah, sometimes the grief is sometimes so painful it's worth holding on to the symptom. I mean, it's very. Right. Well, if I believe I cannot handle grief, then I'll hold on to the symptom forever. Mm -hmm. So then maybe clinically I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if that's actually true if they can't handle grief. If we were together, I wonder if that would be true. If we held it together, I wonder if that would be true. You know? Oh, we could talk about this. Here's the, here's the really hard news is we could talk about this. Speaking of grief, <laughs> we could talk about this for 17 hours and scrape the surface. I know, I know, but we've got about... 17 seconds so. exactly <laughs> but i do i want to say hearing you talk about weaving all these uh, methodologies together is so it feels so rich like your work is mm -hmm. it's limitless that how you can guide someone to these implicit knowings which can can feel intimidating when you're first doing this work of wow i have to get someone to get in touch with their unconsciousness somehow mm -hmm. whereas what you're saying is there's a limitless amount of experiences you can create and slow down in that can help the client do this work for themselves whilst you guide them which is really That's brilliant right. exactly exactly and i wonder of... if if even as people are starting to maybe experiment with this work we just say this if you're in the beginning spaces and sometimes even if you're kind of advanced but never got taught this part we have to slow down and teach our clients how to use therapy space experientially so don't think they should know how to do it. Some of your clients are going to take to it like that, and that's awesome. But most of them won't. So slow down and teach them and be as creative. You could make up brand new stuff that has never been in this world before, but just know this. Oh, right now my goal is to teach them how to be with themselves differently. That's the only thing I'm doing. So I'm teaching them how to be with themselves differently. We're trying experiments. Oh, they didn't that. That one was really hard. That didn't go that great. Let's try this one over here. So my guess is if you're beginning, like a, teaching your clients to use therapy is where to start. Great. That's such great advice. What would you recommend? Like if someone was watching and they're like, oh, I want to learn more about weaving these methodologies together or even learning mm -hmm. about teaching clients how to be experiential or what would you mm -hmm. where would you where would you send them where to? would i go um i have several different things if you're brand new to memory reconsolidation i would turn to ecker's book unlocking the emotional brain um if you're brand new to parts work and you want a really good kind of self-study i would look at brain savvy therapist workbook which is by bonnie badenock if you want more um, uh, physical, like uh, how does memory work within the body? I love Trauma and Memory by Peter Levine. And if you want to know more about kind of how I'm interweaving these, the course that I have out right now is called Neurobiology with Heart. And it is on Therapy Wisdom. Um, what else? You also offer oh a gosh. training in memory reconsolidation, right? I do. If you want to know reconsolidation stuff and you like the way I talk about it, I do have a memory reconsolidation course, and that is also on Therapy Wisdom. And it's called that. It's called Memory Reconsolidation. And it's all about that neuroscience and the details of it and how to work with it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. That sounds like they're such great resources. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry the time is is coming to me an end. too because i, I love know. talking to you i know it's like it's like scratch it is the scratching the surface you're like oh wait we yeah can... but okay what about this type of client or what about when you meet this and uh, but yeah. i really think you gave a real wonderful description of how you work and weave stuff together which is really the mm -hmm. focus of these interviews so thank you mm -hmm. so much oh you're so welcome thank you for having me and thank you to anyone who made it this far your attention is awesome yeah great Thank you so much, Jules.